Don't watch this video if you haven't seen Bacchano and Bacchano Extras. It's only 16 episodes, so watch it before watching this, or else this video won't make any sense. There's this idea I see floating around, that Bacchano is just a show about chaos. That's just dumb fun without any deeper message. This point of view makes sense. In Italian, Bacchano means ruckus. There are, by my count, 20 main characters. The story takes place in three different places in time, and those stories are all told concurrently. That's not even counting the flashback to 1711 and the flash forward to 2001. And the narrative is so bombastic that its first scene exists only as a primer to get the viewer in the right mindset for a story with this many main characters and plotlines. All of this squeezed into 16 episodes. There doesn't seem to be any room for an overarching message. Not every story needs or has an intentional theme, and if any story was just about popcorn entertainment for its own sake, it would seem that this would be it. There are even characters that seem to only exist to increase the overall fun and chaos of events, such as Isaac and Miria. The only problem is that this type of complex story that has this many disparate, seemingly unrelated elements would need some kind of overarching element to add cohesion. Some kind of throughline between the characters and plot elements that makes it feel like these are all part of the same story, not just a bunch of stories haphazardly taped together. The story of Bakuno very much feels like a story, and not just stuff happening, which is a major concern with these types of stories. It all feels intricately connected. This is in part, no doubt, due to the tight, expert writing of Ryugo Narita. Keeping track of all these plotlines while making them understandable and entertaining must have been a monumental feat of writing, but I don't think it can all be attributed to his skill with improvising plotlines and character arcs. Instead, he had the foresight to add a strong thematic foundation that he built the story on top of, a light designed to guide his creative process and add a method to the madness, and I think that foundation is death. If I showed every instance of death being mentioned in dialogue, I'd be showing half the show. It's shocking how often what characters are talking about can be traced back to death. However, what I think is more interesting is how it's woven into characterization. Jacuzzi's overarching motivation is to protect others from death, as shown when he starts crying while having his life threatened by armed gangsters, crying out of fear of their lives, not his. Claire Stanfield's confidence comes from his belief that it's impossible for him to die. If he does, he would simply wake up, because the universe and everyone in it are merely a dreamlike illusion created by his mind. Lad Russo's sole motivation in life is to kill people who aren't conscious of the fact that they can die at any moment. This makes Claire the perfect foil for him. Claire's whole philosophy being about how not thinking it is even possible for him to die makes him an ideal target for Lad to prove him wrong, but Claire's skill as a fighter makes that almost impossible. The only thing that Lua Klein wants in life is to be killed by Lad, but Lad refuses to kill her until he can kill everyone who recognizes death less than her first. Shesla, throughout the majority of the story, is so afraid of death that he vows to devour every immortal he meets before they can devour him. After he becomes immortal, Zillard Quates becomes the avatar of Greed Incarnate. The resource he lusts after most is knowledge, even taking the memories of other immortals, killing them in the process. Misa is propelled by the guilt of believing that he is responsible for the deaths of 18 of his closest friends, one of them being his own brother, at the hands of Zillard. This makes him and Zillard perfect foils. Zillard accuses Misa of being greedy and keeping the recipe of the Grand Panacea for himself, playing favorites and only discussing half the recipe with his brother, as its insurance in case of his own demise. And, in fairness to Zillard, Misa's name is Miser Avarice, so greed is certainly on the table. But Misa's greed is a lot less myopic than Zillard's. It shows in him seizing his newfound power of knowledge to withhold that knowledge from the rest of the crew, despite claiming that he would share it after the ritual. What separates Misa's greed from Zillard's is that Misa's greed is out of empathy. He is willing to withhold his knowledge and break his promises because he sees the outcome of not doing so hurting the people he cares about, and the world as a whole. Whereas Zillard's greed is entirely unempathetic, only wanting the formula to be better able to devour the memories and lives of others. The Grand Panacea itself is a great example of how the theme of death is woven into the narrative. Is there an any more commonly understood story about the fear of death than the Faustian bargain with the devil in exchange for eternal life? This is the inciting incident of the entire story of Bacchano. All of the plotlines in some way spiral out of the ritual board the Avena Avis. This is even alluded to when many of the main characters create that giant domino sculpture, an intricately designed tapestry of individual pieces which impact other pieces, all set off by a single push. It is no coincidence that Misa was the one to create the design, seeing as he was the one who set all these events in motion. He was the alchemist who summoned the devil to learn the secrets of immortality. And I think it is obvious how closely immortality is connected to the concept of death. Although, in the story, death itself is metaphorically represented by the Rail Tracer. The way Isaac, Miria, and Claire describe the Rail Tracer sounds eerily like the specter of death. 
It's like a huge monster that comes chasing after trains. We'll get into this in a few more lines, but trains in this analogy are a metaphor for people as a whole. Shrouded in darkness, the entity can change shape into anything. Death can take many forms. Disease, drowning, decapitation. Most people are not sure how they will die, and the experience itself is very mysterious. It is shrouded in darkness in that way. And little by little, it inches closer and closer to the train until it finally catches up. So what happens when it reaches the train? All the people start to disappear. Death is always inching closer to you. Each second passed, everyone has one fewer second of their lives remaining. And once that timer is up, the people that you once knew disappear. It starts at the back of the train. I think it is worth noting that it is explicitly stated that the poor section is in the back of the flying pussyfoot, as opposed to a typical passenger train where the rich section is in the back. One by one, people turn up missing until every soul on the train is gone. And then as the empty cars are still rolling down the tracks, the train vanishes. <laughs> death can only exist while there are things that are alive. Once death has succeeded in killing all things, it will simply vanish. Death has no meaning when there is nothing that is alive. Which brings up another point. For a story about death, no one really dies. Sillard Quates is the only main character in the show that really dies. Typically in violent gangster stories like this, main characters die all the time. Part of this can be excused with immortality being a major plot element, but only one character of a cast this expansive dying is still odd. Devouring is only really a half-death anyway. While your will and consciousness no longer exist, your memories are passed on to the person who devoured you. It's impossible to really destroy an immortal. Their life story will still exist as a memory in someone else's mind for the rest of time. It seems that, by necessity of being about death, Bachno is also a story about life. To examine what Bachno is saying about life, it makes sense to look at the everlasting life featured in the story. Aboard the Advina Avis, Elmer says, As I contemplate the truth of my newfound immortality, it seems inside me nothing has changed. I'm more the same as ever. My life will move forward without ever ending. I feel no different from those whose lives will end. There is a great sadness, I fear. Somewhere in this endless future, amidst all the joys I know will come my way. So it seems that mortal life isn't actually different from mortal life. And emotions like happiness and sadness are not eternal states, but rather temporary pleasures and torments. This second point is also shown when he later says, Eerie. I've learned that happiness is something like unhappiness. It may strike any time without warning. Where this idea of life gets interesting is when you apply it to the characters. Innes and Shane are very similar characters. Their lives both belong to someone, and act as their servant. For Innes, it's Zillard, and for Shane, it's Hui La Ferre. They also both have their worldviews challenged by their interactions with other characters. For Innes, it's meeting Firo, Isaac, and Miria, and for Shane, it's meeting Claire, Jacuzzi, and Nice. What makes them different is how they respond to that widened worldview. Innes seizes back control of her life by defying Zillard, while Shane chooses to keep her life in the hands of her father, Hui La Ferre. Elmer C. Albatross explains his personal philosophy with this line. I've lived for over 200 years now, and there's probably no meaning to life. So isn't it much better for everyone to smile and enjoy themselves while they're here? To be free from the sorrow and hatred that consumes them, yeah? His only motivation in life is to give other people as many of those bouts of happiness that strike at any time without warning as he can. His joy from seeing other people smile is shown many times, but notably when he asks Huey Laferre to smile while in prison. And Huey responds, Ask me to smile and I'll smile all you want. But what good will it do? What does my smile change? Will it bring the world happiness? Will it cheer it up? It certainly will. My world at the very least. So Elmer is someone who spends his life making a positive influence on other people. Ronnie Shiato, also known as the Devil, gave Elmer a single wish. Elmer at first wishes for Ronnie himself to smile, but since that is impossible, he wishes for Ronnie to stay by Misa's side, as some small consolation for Misa's brother's death, at least until Misa is able to smile again. The devil obliges, even long after Misa is able to smile again, mostly out of curiosity about the unfurling of other people's lives. Fear Perchinezo is a really strange mobster. If I know anything about the Mafia, it's that they don't help you unless they need something in return. But Fira helps people, like Barnes and Ennis, all the time, without any desire to be repaid. Which is interesting, given how his main role in the story is to destroy Zillard. 
the avatar of unempathetic greed, and everything he stands for, both in actually devouring him, and in convincing Ennis to betray him, removing Zillard's control over her, and sealing the completed Grand Panacea, leaving Zillard a ghost of what he once was, a mere memory of a man. For a story that doesn't feature ghosts, they sure are mentioned a lot in Bacchano. The best example would be Huey LaFerre's cultish gang, the Limerays. Limerays are named after a type of ghost from Roman mythology, and the meaning of this name is explained by Goose. In describing themselves as living ghosts, they are signaling that they have cut all ties to the living. They are only loyal to each other, and especially their master, Huey LaFerre. So they have no reason to be afraid of death, since they are already dead. In other words, they are rejecting the idea of life that Bacchano establishes. They refuse to be a positive force in anyone's lives to impart the bouts of happiness that characters like Elmer and Furo enjoy giving so much. This is also similar to how Claire describes all other people as ghosts inside of his head. According to him, all people are an illusion of his mind, effectively making them living ghosts or already dead. However, this is not to say that he is unempathetic towards these ghosts. On the contrary, as the only truly living person, he is quite empathetic. In his own words, Mercy and compassion are virtues that only the strong are privileged to possess. And I am strong. By virtue of being alive, Claire is able to possess compassion, whereas by not possessing compassion, the Limerays are already dead. Immortals are unable to have aliases. They are able to have a temporary one in the company of mortals, but around an immortal, their body will naturally say their actual name in place of a false one. Like when Sheslaw accidentally uses his real name because Isaac and Miria are in earshot, despite not knowing that they are immortals. This is directly contrasted with the character of Claire Stanfield, who believes himself immortal, yet, throughout the story, takes two aliases. The first is Vino, and the second, more important one, is the Rail Tracer. As established, the Rail Tracer is a metaphor for death itself, and death can take many forms. The living are only able to take one, themselves. This is shown both literally, with Cheslaw being stuck in the child body after taking the elixir, and metaphorically, with Misa and Sylvie's grief over Greta's death haunting them for the rest of their eternal lives. This is not to say that Bakuno characters do not change. On the contrary, most of them all have well-realized character arcs. I only mean that the typical shonen formula of positive change only coming through hard work and determination does not apply here. Instead, character development is a much more natural evolution based on the experiences and interactions a character goes through, instead of a desire to be more than themselves. Bakuno characters' lives can only ever be their lives, and they never need be more. Most people I've seen think that the last scene of the show, where Carol and the Vice President of the Daily Days are walking down the street, is saying that story shouldn't end because the ending you, as a viewer, will imagine will always be much more satisfying. That it is, more or less, saying that if you weren't satisfied with its conclusion, you should read or write a fanfiction that continues the story. This is undoubtedly, at least in part, true, especially when the Vice President asks Carol to imagine the life of the immortal rat. And, after a moment, she responds, you're right, sir, it's a lot more fun to imagine the rest! But I think there's a thematic meaning nestled within that point. Earlier in the scene, the Vice President says, Stories are just comprised of people living, in the endless cycle of interacting, influencing each other, and parting ways. If you replace the word stories with life, that statement fits very well with what we have established Bakuno to be saying about life. In the words of Elmer, there's probably no meaning to life. The characters' lives do not have a higher meaning, they are the meaning themselves. The meaning of their life is to live, to be a part of the grand game of influencing and interacting with each other, and, while they're at it, to try to strike some joy into their hearts, to make them be free from the sorrow and hatred that consumes them, yeah? Why not try to put a smile on their face? No characters embody this idea better than Isaac and Miria. They have no grand ambition, their plans, whether it's robbing the Genoards, becoming gold miners, or stealing the stairs to a museum, are all concocted on a whim. What matters is how they positively impact each person they interact with along the way. From giving Jacuzzi the courage to become brave, to influencing Ennis into defying Zillard, to breaking the walls that Sheslaw put around his heart, and showing him that some people can be trusted. Each step in their lives they interact with more people, and influence their lives in a positive way, making many new friends in the process, seemingly without even knowing that's what they're doing most of the time. So, in this way, Bakno is a story about chaos. The chaos of life and death. Life as a series of interactions, influences, and parting ways, in which there is no main character or greater purpose. The purpose is the series of interactions and influences itself, and death as the ultimate parting of ways, the climax of the fall of your domino, 
But the dominoes you've pushed will go on to push other dominoes in a grand mural with no beginning or end. So, in that way, life goes on, even if you are no longer a part of it. But, of course, you will always be a part of it. Your life will always exist in the influences you've made on others, and the interactions and influences that will cause them to create, and so on. In this way, each life influences each other life in a grand, unpredictable, beautiful tapestry.